Let's actually turn on the mic. We turn the music down. Let's turn on the mic. But welcome. Hi, my name is Kevin. I'm a health and safety professional, and this is my channel, Provoking Safety. Um, I like to try and stream every couple of weeks and talk about stuff that's um, going on in health and safety. I talk about a poignant point, if you will, and uh, do a Q&A. So, hey, uh, welcome. And some of you may log in and watch a recording of the stream. And you know what? I know it's a long weekend. So, hey, heaven forbid that you're sitting in front of a computer watching me. You're out at the lake enjoying, well, the weather. Or you're having fun with loved ones or doing something that you love to do. And that's fine. But for those of you that do log in, hey, great. Uh, glad you're here. Before we get going too much, let's talk about just some chat rules right away. So first off, number one, your participation in the whole chat and stream process is awesome. So uh, if you're in the chat and you're not shy, log on and, and introduce yourself. Tell me about yourself, where you're from, what you do. And uh, the other thing is if somebody asks a question in the chat or the comments and I don't get to it in time, uh, please do me a favor, and if you know the answer, chime in. <clears throat> but it, it's important to understand as safety professionals, we pool our knowledge, we uh, work with each other, and uh, we like to see each other grow. So on that note, uh, let's be civil. No name calling, no insults, no ad hominem attacks. We all weren't uh, emerging from the womb with uh, intense health and safety knowledge. We gathered it, and so everybody else is. Now, the other thing with this whole stream and the whole process is this is discussion. It's meant for information. It is not considered professional advice. If there is no contract signed for money changing hands, then as far as I'm concerned, it's not professional advice. It's just meant for information and the exchange of ideas. So there we go. Now, I know the background is a little different. The lighting's a little off. The sound may sound different. But you know what? Um, moving my office to a different room. That's what I'm doing. I'm moving my office. So if things are a little off, I apologize. Um, in the next stream, they'll be even better. And uh, the decor will be changed back there. But for now, it's a curtain with some cheesy lighting. Um, yeah. However, hopefully it doesn't detract from the information and what we're going to talk about. A couple of things. Uh, I want to do uh, an upcoming stream on the influence of it, politics, government politics on health and safety. So if anybody wants to do me a favor and chime in either in the comments or the chat with thoughts and opinions on how politics affects safety, I'd love to hear it because right now in Alberta, we're undergoing some political turmoil and uh, I'm just wondering what kind of effect that will have on health and safety. When we uh, stopped after four decades of conservative, um, how should we say, leadership in the government and uh, a different government body and party took over, uh, things changed for health and safety, in my opinion, uh, for the good. Um, there was a significant change to the health and safety legislation it actually got revisited and edited and updated with some significant and beneficial updates after pretty much four decades of stagnation. Can you picture legislation stagnating for that amount of time? I couldn't. But anyway, it was for the better. So I'm just wondering what people think about the politics and health and safety. And I mean government politics. I'm not talking about internal and corporate politics. Now, the other thing that we uh, should also address, too, is um, maybe, and feel free to weigh in, the latest thing, the monkeypox. How do you think that is going to affect your job as a health and safety professional, especially with what we've just gone through? Um, uh, lots of different uh, things happening out there, lots of different weird information. And the other thing is social media is quick to... Uh, do their censorship thing because I just posted a funny picture on uh, my own private Facebook channel and Facebook automatically targeted it and had a, a pandemic information thing in there. And, and so all, all kind of weird, really, when you get right down to it. But I'm just interested in your thoughts. 
and especially how um, you might be addressing it with your health and safety committee. Are you working with your health and safety committee? And and that's the question. And and you saw the question in the description that I asked. Uh, like, do you treat them as a necessary evil? Like when you're the safety professional and you have this vast amount of knowledge, are you treating and looking at your safety committees as a necessary evil? Are you looking them at them as a waste of your precious time? Uh, and your time is a hot commodity. We all understand that our time is exactly that, a hot commodity to us. And it's precious and we don't want to waste it. Understood. But how are you looking at your health and safety committees? You know, I can tell you that when I first started off in health and safety and I had to work with health and safety committees, and I imagine we all do have our early impressions or some mixed perceptions of our experiences with health and safety committees. Like, I mean, sometimes the meetings look like a scene from Braveheart and uh, other times you hear crickets and nobody wants to talk and it's like Ferris Bueller's teacher. Anyone? Anyone? And uh, participation is minimal, etc. Or you have those that want to do everything. And so we all have mixed perceptions on health and safety committees. And one of the mistakes, well, I made a few, I made lots, but one of the mistakes I made is, is butting heads with them and, and not understanding their value. And so that's what I want to talk about today. There's actually three points that you as a safety professional can take away uh, of the value of a health and safety committee and what they can do for you. And, and number one is they can lighten the load. If you've worked to them and, and helped to, pardon me, if you've worked with them and helped to create an experienced and effective health and safety committee, they can lighten your load. I want you to consider that if you have uh, a large area to conduct work site inspections or multiple areas, like, and, and this may sound like a lot, but one of my uh, previous jobs, I had 108 square, 108,000 square kilometers <clears throat> under my purvey as a health and safety professional. And can you imagine trying to do regular inspections? Because the legislation in the jurisdiction at that time said work site inspections have to be conducted monthly. What would else would I get done? Really, what else would I get done? Um, so, I mean, if you're training them and they are understanding how to conduct work site inspections effectively, understanding what to look for, um, actual safety concerns and emerging hazards versus aesthetics and uh, niceties and just general worker complaints about the atmosphere to actual looking for emerging hazards or deficiencies in understanding the corrective action process, then you know what? You've got an asset. You've got an asset because you have more to do than just work site inspections. And I have, I've met health and safety professionals that uh, just do work site inspections. It's like, really? What else do you do? What about editing your program? What about uh, uh, reviewing your program? What about uh, any kind of other compliance auditing process that you might have in place or that your jurisdiction wants you to be looking after? So realistically, that's just one, but what about incident investigations? I mean, uh, hopefully, you're only doing one-off incident, incident investigations once in a while. I mean, can you picture if you're doing one every month? I think you better rethink your program and, and what you have in it. Just, just a thought. Yeah. Um, but realistically, when it comes to an incident investigation, and, and there I'll leave a playlist in the description regarding incident investigation theory and practice, but you know what? Uh, you can't do it all if it's a big incident, if it's uh, if it's um, an incident where there's been significant time loss from workers or asset damage or both, you're going to need help. You're going to need help to do things like line up witness interviews or uh, to sketch the scene or to take pictures or to help with document review and gathering the necessary documents and things like that. So you basically what I'm saying is is a good effective health and safety committee can lighten the load. They can lighten your load. And you can understand that you can work prioritizing your um, duties and tasks better if you have someone there to help. Now, it's not their full-time job. 
Of course not. They have other jobs. This health and safety committee part is just part of their duties. But often a lot of jurisdictions will actually have it written into the legislation that health and safety committee membership has to be allowed time away from the regular duties to fulfill that membership duty and requirement. So it's a good possibility that you can have an incident. You can say, I need three people from the health and safety committee. These are the three people. Tell your supervisors. And uh, I'm looking at needing each of you for about two hours today. Whatever the case may be. But at least you're not backed up. And you know what? Here's my other personal finding. Murphy is alive and well in, in safety. And then when you're in the midst of an incident investigation, you get four call, phone calls, two complaints, uh, uh, another small incident, and possibly your authority having jurisdiction wants a site visit. So realistically, work with your safety committee. Work with your safety representative. Work with those people and, and raise them up because they can be a huge asset. And that's just lightening the load. Now, what about the next thing? I've had a lot of conversations recently with people that want to implement programs in their workplaces. And, and a lot of different ones. It really doesn't matter what the program is. But really and truthfully, when you want to lead an initiative like this, when you want to bring an initiative to the forefront, you have a lot of different facets. You have to bring stuff to the executive. A lot of times it'll require a business case. It may require uh, some evidence-based uh, data and reporting. You may require a lot of different things to bring this uh, to fruition. And really and truthfully, if you understand any kind of process in that where you want to implement something, you need, oh, my camera is frozen again. But my other camera isn't. So at least what we can do is, um, yeah, um, work a little bit like this and I can bring the camera back. But uh, just saying this, if um, you've worked with anything previously in the past regarding um, uh Oh, my camera is not working. This is embarrassing. Really need to fix this. But uh, if you've worked with uh, any kind of process where you've trying to tried to implement something and you realize you need two things, you need uh, a champion and you need collaborators. If you have a champion who will... Um, champion your cause and and do things for the betterment uh, of affecting this process that's great and that and, and some people might call them a spokesperson but usually this person is going to be one of the management representatives on the committee and uh you they can help you with bringing things to the executive so having a champion usually a senior manager or something is great and then the collaborators because you need uh collaborators to do this. And you might find if you're pulling your committee and understanding your committee members and getting to know them, you might find that you have people that are experienced in writing business cases or can help you and give you tips on writing business cases. You might have people that are experienced with uh, costing and, and predictive maintenance and things like that. So you can look at having champions and collaborators on your committee. So you can make a proposal that could even just be an informal proposal and they can help you get that process to fruition. Say, for instance, you want to look at uh, bringing into your workplace something that many workplaces need, and that is um, a physical demands analysis process to be matched with every single job description. And, and it's it is the best way to do things like manage, managing graduated return to work and lost time injury processes. And we're going to talk a bit more about those as we move along. So stay tuned. <clears throat> but having that physical demands analysis process is huge, but it's a huge undertaking. So it could be part of the business of the committee to help with that. So it's just a thought. Understanding that committees can help lighten the load 
but they can also have within them your champions needed to push something and help you to implement something, plus collaborators to bring it to a formal fruition process where you can turn a good report into the executive or a good proposal or a good business case, whatever you want to call it, and you likely you will have a better chance of getting it passed. I was fortunate. I had one person on a team, uh, one of my teams, and she was an incredible writer, an incredible business writer and everything. And so believe you me, I leveraged her. And uh, when I worked with a different health and safety committee, I discovered someone that was very much the same. And by all means, he was brilliant and helped me quite a bit. So you know what? It, Understand that your committees are useful in many different um, aspects. Now, the other one I'll leave you with, it's kind of twofold. <clears throat> uh, and maybe we'll spin it off into, th in, into four, three and four. But number three is the contribution that they can give. If you have a well-balanced committee, and my camera is froze again. I don't know that I like this. It um, has to do with the capture card, I think. Yeah. But if you are working with a good, well-balanced committee and uh, they are, how should I say, representative of a lot of the different stakeholder groups in the organization, then you know what? You're going to have people on there who can be a huge help in a lot of different instances. They can, uh, if you have journeymen, tradespeople, if you have people from the business side, etc. So when you're wanting to write a safe work procedure, you already have good eyes and ears for the needs. And so doing a needs assessment isn't nearly as arduous because you have that representation right there. You have good, healthy representation to do that needs assessment. And, and that's the bonus. That's huge. <clears throat> but also, too, is you have on it a management understanding of the impact possible if you don't have those written procedures. So when it comes to writing them, reviewing them, editing them, you have that contribution process there because if you're just writing them yourself and i've made mention of it in other videos you're making a huge mistake and you're doing your employer and organization a huge disservice because you have one set of eyes and one opinion and that's it and so what you've observed and understood unless you're it's part of your skill set say you're on uh, a mechanic a certified mechanic qualified mechanic as well as a safety professional great then you know what you could have uh, YouTube's not receiving enough error. That's weird. Uh, enough data. Oh, well, I'm just going to keep going anyway. But <clears throat> um, if somebody wants to hop into the chat and just let me know if they're receiving the video, I'd appreciate it. But um, anyway, uh, back to what I was saying. If you're a skilled tradesperson and you have to write a, a safe work procedure on that, by all means, that's great and you can understand it. However, however, here's the thing. What if you're not, but you're still tasked with writing that safe work procedure? Then you know what? Then you're going to need to rely on good, healthy contribution from people that are knowledgeable. Plus, they can take that draft back to the stakeholder group. So you have built into your health and safety committee the ability to do a needs as, uh, analysis. You have the ability to create a point-by-point -point process in which you're going to write that safe work procedure. And then you have good qualified reviewers that can personally review it and give, hey, thanks, Lerny. Uh, awesome. Um, YouTube, as usual, is um, giving me a false positive or false negative. But you can take that um, whole entire group and they can review your process and that way you come out of it at the end with a well-written document. Now the last piece is it sort of gives you an indicator on what you're doing. Now one of your most important jobs as a safety professional is to help and aid in fostering a healthy and progressive health and safety culture. And what I mean by progressive is it works on the process of continuous improvement. If people are average, 
then you should be inspiring them to be better. And if they are getting to the point with their, where they're better, then you should be inspiring to them to the point where they're good. And if they're good, work to get them to great. And with a health and safety committee that's working well, they can have that finger on the pulse and they can bring you their perceptions of what's happening within that health and safety realm in the organization. Yes, you're always going to have your detractors. You cannot please everybody all of the time. But if everybody on the committee is reporting back from what their stakeholder perceptions are, then you really have a good compass direction. You have a good finger on the pulse. And really and truthfully, you can mold your whole entire safety program that way. And it also makes it when you're reporting back to the executive, and hopefully uh, you have a good relationship <clears throat> where you are doing um, frequent reports to the executive and, and providing them um, a perception of health and safety in the organization. You may have to have the executive or, or prompt the executive to be asking the question, what's the safety culture like in our organization? Or they may be asking that already, and at least you're able to give them a qualified, incredible report on it because you can say, uh, part of our discussions within our health and safety committee meetings are talking about the current safety culture, current trends, where we are and where we should be heading and how we're going to get there. So anyway, once again, just to recap, remember, health and safety committees lighten your load. They make things easier for you and they help you to prioritize your duties and tasks really on a daily basis. They're awesome as having champions and collaborators when you're trying to implement new processes or bring, um, how should we say, stagnant processes back to life within your health and safety program or your management system. They're also valuable contributors to whatever you're doing. So train them up well and work with them to better uh, to bring them to a betterment so that they can contribute to what you're doing. You can't write your safety program alone. And if you're trying it, you're doing a disservice. And finally, the last thing is they help you to understand how well of a job you're doing by being a good pulse of the safety culture, by being that uh, analysis of the safety culture. So there you go. Now, <clears throat> um, YouTube still is saying I'm getting an error, but whatever. I mean, I'm. Eh, it seems we're doing okay. Anyway, um, as far as it goes, the next set of questions we have are, are quite varied, actually. First question uh, comes from Seifeldean. Uh, let me just find it here. There we go. He asks... Can you explain lost time injury, work loss, a work loss day, and restricted work injury? And you know, excellent question. And really and truthfully, I'm going to actually leave that up just to guide me through this. There's a lot of different terms that run through, that we run a gamut of in, in health and safety. And a lot of them work around lost time injuries and then return to work, whether it be a graduated return to work or a full return to work. And, and so lost time injuries are just this. Whenever a worker has had an injury in the workplace that cannot be managed in the workplace where they can even do modified duties and they have to leave work to seek medical aid, treatment and therapy, then that's a lost time injury because they've lost productivity. They've lost time and they have to seek medical aid and get treatment. Now, that may be one day lost, it may be hours lost from the workday, but either way, it's still a lost time injury. What you need to do is also make sure that you're aware of whatever government reporting you have to do with your authority having jurisdiction, because it does vary from authority to authority, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So make sure that you're well aware of what you have to do for reporting. Usually if a worker loses time to seek medical aid and there's a compensation process in place, your authority having jurisdiction needs to be notified. That's usually a good rule of thumb, but not all the time. Now, the next thing is, is they have a work loss day and, and that sort of falls on that same thing. If um, some organizations will, uh, determine that if a worker loses so many hours, that's considered a work loss day. 
And a lot of times, depending on collective agreements or company process, that worker might not return to work at all that day. And they may just return for duty the next day if they're able to. So once again, it works under the same thing, just a different term. As um, a person left me a comment the other day, and uh, they said, uh, he, and he's from Down Under, he's from Australia, and he said that, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at uh, the channel, a lot of the things are very, very similar and the same, just different terms. And they are. Uh, terms differ all over the place. Whether and, and I've seen where in the Middle East, you'll have lots of different terms. I've talked to safety professionals that work uh, actively there. Uh, versus in Europe or here in Canada or in the United States. But what does that term define? Same thing as a restricted work injury. A lot of times here in Canada, what we call it is a graduated return to work, where the person has been unable to return to their duties, uh, their normal duties, but they're well enough to come back to work on either modified, where they redu do less, say and they might have restrictions, where uh, they cannot lift any more than 10 pounds or they cannot sit for an extended amount of time, or they cannot stand for an extended amount of time, or they may uh, graduate to regular duties, but only in a certain time frame, two hours a day, three hours a day, and it may go up. So we work with what's called a graduated return to work process. But now some people may come back to work and they um, can do meaningful work and they're productive, but they cannot do what they used to do. And so they may have a permanent restriction on them. No longer able to lift normal weights, only able to lift 10 pounds, but they're able to do a job. And I've seen cases where um, I've seen people that were mechanics uh, work into data processing. I've seen people that were carpenters end up becoming health and safety professionals because of an injury. So um, you have a different process there. You have a lost time to seek medical aid and treatment because you can't be at work because of your injury. Then you have that time loss that's occurred and you're off work because of your injury and needing to recuperate. And then you're able to start coming back to work and you work on a graduated return to work process, whether you may have restricted work because of an injury and you may have certain restrictions, or you may come back to work in full capacity, but only a certain amount of time per day. So it's what it looks like. And you have to be aware of a few things. Number one, if you have a collective agreement in place, do you have a joint job evaluation and rehabilitation committee, things like that? Do you have um, uh, already uh, union representatives needing to examine the graduated return to work process? Do you have a company doctor that looks after that, et cetera, or a company physical therapist or a company occupational therapist that works in conjunction. So there's, believe it or not, there's a myriad of different processes out there. Just make sure that you're aware of two things. Number one, what your authority, three things, what your authority having jurisdiction says is required. So, and your compensator, whether it be an insurance company or a government compensation model. And then finally, what is your company requirement? So I hope, Seifeldeen, that answered the question. It was a bit of a long, drawn-out explanation, but yeah, yeah, hopefully it answered the question. Now, um, somebody that's been um, conversing with me via email over the last little while, uh, Jim Folston, and uh, Jim runs a company called Folston Safe Work Consulting, Folston Group Safe Work Consulting, and um, what he does is he trains uh, security guards, security officers, and asset people that work in asset protection. And uh, he did pose an interesting question. So going to answer and make a point here. And he says, I'm wondering if you've done anything on claim avoidance. In the security industry, employers often use avoidance for all the reasons you know. I'm trying to instruct students that doing them, that they're doing themselves a grave disservice by accommodating employers to the play these games. And of course, it's a violation of OHS law. Absolutely. It's um, a, a couple of different cases here. Uh, first off, number one, depending on the jurisdiction you work in, like say, for instance, in British Columbia, Canada, the compens uh, the insurance compensation uh, group and the OHS authority are both under one, Work WorkSafe BC. So make sure uh, you're aware of what your jurisdiction says. Most compensation models 
will state that it is um, a non-compliance offense to counsel someone to avoid a worker's compensation claim. So, uh, and to put that in simplistic terms, if an employee gets injured, you as the supervisor, manager, president, CEO, whatever, can say, hey, don't make a claim, we'll look after you. And that also can be looked at in some jurisdictions. It's also kind of against the rules to settle out of it privately. Some will say, yep, you can subrogate by all means. Um, so make sure that you're aware of the model that you're working under and what the authority having jurisdiction says, because it can provide you some leeway. And I've seen cases where people want to muddy the waters. And I, I had one CFO ask me, can't I just pay that person and get them off our back? Uh, the answer is no. So it, you want to make sure that you're uh, completely aware. And even if you have to say to somebody, hold off, I'll research the law and get back to you. And it might be a phone call or an email to your authority having jurisdiction or your insurer just to clarify things. Same thing is, is if you're working in between your uh, compensation body, your occupational compensation body, and a long-time disability coverage insurance body, you, there's some jurisdictions that will say you cannot share information back and forth between the two of them. So once again, you have to watch because somebody, uh, whether it be the injured party, the worker, um, somebody may say to you, hey, can you just give my file to such and such uh, a group? The answer in a lot of times is no. So make sure that you're aware of what you're doing, what you're operating under, because you can uh, how should I say? What's the English thing? It get into a sticky wicket? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, gone a while without the camera freezing. Famous last words. So uh, those were the only two questions I had, plus the ones that I posed at the beginning. Uh, is there anything in the chat? I haven't seen anything. Does anybody have any questions? Because if not... I can end it, and then, then I have to go back to work cleaning my office. So um, I, I don't want to clean that quickly, but uh, if I have to, I suppose I will, because I'll be productive. But uh, question, who here in the chat is having a long weekend? So I just want to see, because um, in Canada right now, it's Victoria Day weekend. So I just want to see who's having a long weekend. I guess I'm the only one, and... I'm the only one that's working during a long weekend. So, oh well. Uh, hey, uh, for those of you that did tune in, thanks a lot. Um, when I end the stream and you have other questions, if you think of them, by all means, leave them in the comments. Send me emails, uh, post on Facebook, or send me something, uh, direct message in Twitter. Oh, Thornydale has a question. I won't leave. I'll wait. Um, but yeah, by all means, the, the links to uh, my Facebook page and my Twitter are on the channel banner. Also, my email address is there. And by all means, if you leave a question in any one of the comments of the videos, I try to get and answer all of the comments uh, that are posted. And uh, I'll do it whenever I can. So by all means, leave me a comment. I appreciate all of the comments. Um, I appreciate likes too. And uh, if uh, you think somebody might benefit from this channel, by all means, um, share it. Sharing is caring, after all, isn't it? Yes, sharing is caring. Okay, Thornydale, I'm in the US and recently went to Toronto for my company for safety. Everything was Green Book. Is there an online version that I can reference? I couldn't find one. Um, yeah, we have, and I don't have the, it's in a box in my other office. In Alberta here, we call it the Blue Book. And you know what? What I will do is I will research. I think what you're talking about is the Ontario 
uh, OHS legislation. And what I will do is I will publish uh, in the in the uh, description uh, links to all of the different health and safety jurisdictions in Canada. And I'll put them there so that you can have a look at the different online versions. Uh, my personal opinion, I think the best one that we have in our provinces is in British Columbia and WorkSafe BC. It's one of the most um, accessed health and safety websites on the planet, I'm told. Uh, but I think what you're talking about is the Green Book, which is in um, for Ontario. But I'll do that, Thorny, and I'll put one, uh, sorry, Thornydale. I'll put one uh, uh, some links in the description for you to go ahead and research. I have to say, um, OSHA's website is is pretty cumbersome in the United States, but I find the U.S. Navy's uh, Occupational Health and Safety website is incredible and and very well managed. Uh, I haven't had to do a lot of U.S. research, but some, but I've still found that compared to here in Alberta. OSHA's website is still much better than what we have here in Alberta. We basically have a repository for PDFs. And really and truthfully, control F and, and that, and we're in the 21st century. Can somebody please put that stuff online? Okay, Jason Kenny, you're leaving. Maybe it's your last act. Sign that something into place so that we can get at least accessible health and safety information that's not so cumbersome. I wonder if I'm going to get in trouble for that one. Oh, well. Anyway, there we go. Uh, Thornydale, did that help your question any? And while I'm waiting for his reply, is there any other questions, thoughts, comments, anything you'd like to see uh, besides my camera freezing. Oh, it came back. Look at that. Um, anything else that you'd like to see on the channel? Any uh, subjects that you want to uh, hear about, etc. as far as they pertain to health and safety? Um, I really don't have a lot of expertise in other things, but um, yeah, as far as it goes with health and safety, I, I have a, a fair bit of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, and honestly, um, Thorny Dale, that's um, one of the things that's disconcerting. And maybe, too, if you want to do me a favor and drop me um, a line in the comments, just to, if you accessed or had the copy of that green book, just what it's called, and I can do some more research into it for you. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, it's the WSIB or the, um, and I forget what, um, I can see the, the logo in my mind, but I forget what Ontario calls their um uh, Authority having jurisdiction for OHS. I forget what they call the body. They all fall under the Ministry of Labor here in Canada. But uh, yeah, so I'll do what I can to research that. And like I said, I'll put some helpful links in the description. And that way, too, it's always good if you can compare. Uh, whereabouts in the U.S. are you, Thornydale, if I can ask? Oh, you see, that's um, really and truthfully, I find that a bit remiss. It's like uh, when you're going to be doing a um, a presentation or working with oh, Louisville. Oh, hey, cool. Home of the bat. Yes, I had a lot of Louisville sluggers growing up. Loved those bats. Um, uh if you're working with a health and safety professional, they should actually be uh, providing you 
good examples of what they're quoting for and referring to, and and um, it's kind of disappointing. I'm sorry about that, and and uh, yeah, um, I will do what I can and see what I can get back to you, and I'll just drop something in the description, or I will even maybe comment on the um, uh, leave a comment in the um, comments for the stream. Either way, so that you um, it'll bring it to your attention. Yeah. Yeah, so, hey, thank you uh, very much for all that uh, um, joined and logged in. I uh, look forward. I'm going to try and stream again in a couple of weeks and uh, have a couple of ideas uh, about what I want to start off with. So, But in the meantime, uh, anybody that's interested, leave me a question or two, and I'll do my best to answer it. Okay? So, anyway, um, with no further ado, whoops. I left. I didn't mean to leave that quick. Sorry. Um, let's bring back the music. And uh, yeah, with no further ado, I'll let everyone go. Enjoy your weekends. And I look forward to seeing you next time. But until I do, do me a favor. Once again, be a safety influencer. Be a leader. Provoke safety wherever you are. Don't just think about it and talk about it, but provoke it and do it. Okay? Take care. Bye for now.